Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming this evening. So, um, as you heard, my name is Yanis Spiliotis. I'm a clinical researcher and a diabetes registrar working here in Oxford. And uh, my talk this evening is going to be, um, as you can see, diabetes, fat, and sugar uh, behind the headlines. Now, there are quite a lot of headlines about diabetes. It's um, constantly in the news, and these. These headlines, almost every week, there's something different uh, published about it. And these headlines alert us to the, uh, the scale of the problem that we're facing. It also talks to us about how much it's going to cost to deal with this sort of medical health issue. Um, and also some provocative headlines, uh, purposely, purposely there, that do, don't necessarily help help the arguments. But amongst all of that, there's also um, quite a lot that's going through about the research that's going on. We hear about new trials, uh, new research projects, and we hear useful things now, uh, particularly lately, about the impact that these chronic conditions, like diabetes, have on mental health and what that means for the emotional toll uh, that it takes. There are also quite a few uh, terms that are, that are used when we talk about diabetes, and they can be a bit bewildering. And so uh, throughout this evening, what I'm going to try to do is uh, make it a little bit more clear and try to, um, try to simplify some of these concepts. And as some of you may know, it was World Diabetes Day on Monday. So um, as, it, as we were looking at it from a global perspective, I thought it, was, it would be useful to just start off with a wider, um, a wider view of the problem. So these are, this is some information from the International Diabetes Federation. And um, as you can see, overall, throughout the world, um, it was estimated that there are about 415 million people uh, living with diabetes. And over the course of the next years, it's set to increase significantly. Um, what you can also maybe appreciate from this map is that it's not evenly distributed. So there are areas around the world that really bear the brunt of this chronic condition much more than some others. And the Western Pacific and Southeast Asia, the numbers dwarf the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the world. And that's probably going to be something that we will have to deal with on a, on a global scale uh, within our working lifetimes. If we think about the uh, UK perspective as well, uh, the numbers are that about four and a half million people are living with diabetes in the UK. So that's around one in 16 compared to the one in 17 that was estimated around the world. But equally and worryingly, there are about a million people who are yet undiagnosed. And this is, this is because some of the features of diabetes aren't always very clear and it doesn't, it doesn't trigger, trigger alarm bells usually. But let's get straight to the point. And when we talk about diabetes, we mean a condition in which the body has difficulty controlling its own blood sugar. And um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to use the terms sugar and glucose interchangeably, even though uh, glucose is a, is a subtype of sugar. But if we look at the range of blood sugar that uh, the body uh, normally experiences, it has a comfort zone that lies roughly between 4 and 10 millimoles per liter. We, uh, and at any given time, for somebody who doesn't have diabetes, we would expect that their blood sugar levels would be somewhere around there. Uh, anything above, sort of above 10, we can consider as hyperglycemia, so high blood sugar and anything below around four as hypoglycemia, so low blood sugar. Now, if we were to just measure uh, the blood sugar of somebody who doesn't have diabetes throughout the day, we might see a pattern similar to this. But actually, nowadays, we have devices that allow us to monitor the blood sugar um, every 10 or 15 minutes, and we can get a much better um, resolution, a better appreciation of the fluctuations of uh, blood sugar. And this can reveal um, trends that weren't obvious um, previously. Oops, let's hope this works. What would this look like in somebody who doesn't have diabetes? So what I did was I tried 
uh, I put on one of these glucose monitors myself, and this measures my blood sugar every five minutes throughout the day. And I wanted to see what was, what was revealed. So apologies, it doesn't come out so well on this, but if you have a look, I started around lunchtime. So given the fact that this was going to be recorded, I decided to have a, a fairly healthy meal. <laughs> and so I started off with a salad. Um, and as you can see, it, my blood sugar did rise a little bit uh, after the meal, but not, not sub, uh, significantly. And afterwards, there were some desserts around, so I had, some, I had a muffin as well, and that had a bit of a peak, but again, nothing dramatic. Um, as the day progressed, um, we had a late afternoon meeting, and uh, there were some cookies around there, so I decided again, just to see what would happen, to try some cookies. And there was a bit of a spike, but nothing, nothing huge that you could really um, appreciate from there. Then in the evening, I uh, convinced my wife that for the sake of science, I should have dessert before dinner. And so um, I had uh, some Lucozade and some chocolate caramel. Um, as you can see here, and you might be able to appreciate it from before, my blood sugar rose to the highest points quite quickly. So it went up to eight, which it hadn't been uh, before, stayed there for a while, and then came lower than it had done at any other point during the day. So it went all the way down to 4.0. Later that day, so afterwards, I had some, some proper dinner. So I had some complex carbohydrates, some fat, and some uh, protein. And that recovered my blood sugar to a nice steady level, and it stayed like that uh, throughout the rest of the day. So then the following day, I tried something similar. So I had, again, my, uh, my healthy lunch, but I put some fruit in there as well. And as you'll appreciate, there was, there was quite a spike. And that's most likely because of the fact that I did have some citrus fruit there. Um, but it was short-lived, and it quickly resolved again to come back to normal levels. And that evening, uh, instead of having some cookies, I decided instead to go to the gym. Uh, even though I could see from my monitor that my blood sugar was actually going low and it was hovering around just above four. So I said I'd give it a try just to see what would happen. And in actual fact, um, as you can see from there, my blood sugar didn't continue dropping. And if anything, it actually started going up a bit and it plateaued to a very comfortable level around about five and a half, six. And that's because my own body was releasing um, glucose or sugar that it, from its internal stores and making good use of that energy that it had um, taken up during my meals. Um, an interesting point as well is that after, the, after I exercised, I didn't actually feel that hungry anymore. Um, so I convinced a couple of my lab friends to uh, give this a try as well. So I put some, uh, some monitors on them and they went out exercising and they went out for a much longer run than I did. And yet, the same kind of pattern uh, existed, that even though they may have started off going a little bit low or started off at a lower level, they didn't continue that. And it actually just, um, uh, just tailed off very nicely. And they said it's a very comfortable level throughout the entire run. And in fact, if we look at their um, blood glucose tracing, so the average over a two week period, it's pretty much a flat line despite all the various things that they were doing, the things that they were eating, the exercise they were doing, the alcohol they were drinking, all of that, um, the body was able to cope with. Now, compare this with somebody who has um, difficult to manage type 1 diabetes. This trace is from one of our patients who we see in clinic. And you'll appreciate that there is wide variability. So there are times when a blood sugar can be all the way up at 20, but equally there are times that can, it can go all the way below four, and at this point uh, had reached levels below three. The mean, so the average that's shown by the red line, also doesn't have that much value because at any given point, it could be anywhere. Um, and this is really the sort of day-to-day um, -day issues that uh, people with diabetes occasionally face, if they, particularly if they're on things like insulin. But uh, at this point, uh, I'd like us to turn the clock back and 
just think about what the world was like a hundred years ago. Um, it's a very turbulent time, and many of us can't really imagine what, what it was really like. But during that time, there was an acute illness that affected um, children that was well documented. It was uh, one, of the, one of the main causes of acute illness in children that was invariably fatal. Um, we knew what it was called, so it already had a name. It was called diabetes mellitus, and this was, uh, the name comes from the fact that these patients pass a large amount of urine that's sweet tasting. And this wasn't new. This has been well documented for, since antiquity. So in ancient Greece and Egypt and India, there were very clear documentation cases of um, this sort of disease. Uh, this sort of condition, but there was nothing that we could do for it. The closest thing that we had to a management plan was a starvation diet, and that only allowed these young patients to survive maybe a couple more years uh, until they finally succumbed. So into this field um, came a very unlikely pairing. So we had here on the left an orthopedic surgeon, and a biochemist. Now, their names were Frederick Banting and John McLeod. Um, they both worked in Toronto, in Canada, and in 1921, their work led to the discovery of insulin, one of the most significant and, and um, highest impact medical discoveries in, uh, over the course of history. Now, this, this therapy was almost immediately taken up and was tried on the young patients, and it was life-saving. This was the same patient uh, a few months later. And if we think about how it, when it was used in other places, well, these skeletal patients were completely transformed within the, within the matter of a couple of months. Um, for their work, these two, these two scientists were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1923 for um, physiology and medicine. But as with most big, especially medical achievements, they didn't do it alone. So with them were working some other people as well. So Charles Best, who was a medical student at the time, was a research assistant for um, Frederick Banting. Um, they were both trying to isolate this new, uh, this new uh, compound called insulin, but they were having a lot of difficulty with it. They were working in the lab of McLeod, but he assigned a fellow biochemist called James Cullip to actually help them because they weren't able to isolate the insulin in a form that could be given to humans. So all of their work contributed to this, uh, to this great achievement. And it wasn't just them. Throughout the years, there were other people who contributed substan substantially to our understanding and our development of insulin as a therapy. And one very clever and very hardworking uh, woman was called Dorothy Hodgkins. So she was a structural biochemist, which means that um, her area of discipline was looking at trying to investigate what these molecules actually looked like in three dimensions. She spent 35 years working on the structure of, diabetes, of, of insulin, and finally, uh, in 1969, was able to reveal it. This was despite her suffering from rheumatoid arthritis in her early 20s. And this particular portrait in the National Portrait Gallery, I think, really sums up the sort of person she was. Um, Without her discovery, it's important to say that we wouldn't even have the sorts of insulins that we have today. Um, taking a little bit of a sidestep from all of this, um, we can also consider what we had as tools at that time to really monitor these, um, these sorts of patients. It was very much to do with trying to establish how much uh, glucose there was in sugar, <coughs> sorry, in the urine. And uh, as I alluded to earlier, one of the earliest ways was actually tasting it. But uh, as our scientific knowledge progressed 
we were able to uh, uh, we were able to discover other ways in which um, urine uh, glucose amounts could be estimated, but really the breakthrough came when uh, this moved to a very uh, to a much easier and more useful way of measuring blood glucose and um, this this particular glucose um, monitor that doesn't look that dissimilar to some of the ones that we have nowadays. Um, work for this was actually done at Oxford as well. Um, these, were the, these were the pioneering devices that really led the way for more modern, um, more modern devices that we have, but they're all based on very similar chemistry. Uh, even the ones here, for example, that are continuous, that monitor your blood sugar continuously. Now, let's have a look at what they actually did discover. Um, we knew that the pancreas, well, they knew as well that the pancreas was very important for, um, for the pathology of diabetes, and there must be something in there that held the key. Uh, the pancreas is a gland that sits just below the stomach, and it contains within it um, about 2% of these clusters of cells called islets. They're named islets because they look like little islands in, um, in amongst all this other 98% of tissue that it has to do with digesting food. Uh, to give you an idea of scale as well, the uh, one islet is about half the size of a, a grain of uh, castor sugar. So they're tiny, they can vary in sizes, and they're incredibly interesting to uh, investigate. As I said, they're clusters of cells, so they, they coordinate their activity and they work together. Um, but insulin, which uh, is released from the beta cells, which are the ones that make up the majority of the islet. Now, we need insulin in order to uh, be able to make use of all the sugar that we take in during food. Our body can't see it. It can't make use of the glucose if there isn't insulin around. And if there isn't, insulin, if there isn't enough insulin around, the glucose stays in the blood. There's a really good short video about the basics of how um, of the mechanics of diabetes and how um, these things happen. So um, I'm I won't go into too much detail about it, but the um, the analogy that I really like, and it's one of the ones that I, I use even now, um, is to think about it as a wall of insulin resistance. So there exists within this body, within our body, this theoretical wall. Our, our beta cells, our pancreas, our pancreatic islets need to produce enough insulin to overcome this wall of insulin resistance. And it can change. It goes up, it goes down, and it's not necessarily bad. So there is physiological, so normal variation in insulin resistance throughout the day, it's also present during uh, puberty in our developments. It's, it's necessary to allow the body to develop well, and it's also present during pregnancy. As this fluctuation goes up and down, the body can make best use of the fuel it already has while still protecting its stores. Problems occur when it's outpaced. So things like an unhealthy diet or physical inactivity uh, particularly putting on uh, fat uh, around the tummy seems to predispose us to um, developing increased insulin resistance far beyond what our body would normally experience. And as the wall gets higher, the islets try to compensate and make more insulin. But at some point, they can't keep up. And that's where diabetes starts occurring. There are various ways that we can uh, there are various ways that we can use medication to try to help this. And again, one uh, an easy way of thinking about it is um, there are certain tablets that can prop up the ability of the islets themselves to produce insulin, and so uh, useful that way. Equally, in some instances, it's important to actually use insulin itself uh, as injections, and that's a top up. So the body's still producing insulin in these cases, it's just not producing enough. And it requires that extra help in order for it to function properly. But as the condition progresses, uh, 
more and more insulin is required from injections because the body can't cope with it. It's starting to be, become exhausted. There are also cases where the body doesn't produce insulin and in those circumstances insulin injections are the lifesavers and they're the ones that are absolutely necessary even though there is not high insulin resistance. So as we've said there, there are different types of diabetes and I'm sure people are aware of the main two categories. So there's type 1 diabetes um, in which the body can't produce the insulin that's required and type 2 diabetes in which the body produces insulin but can't use it effectively. Um, type 2 diabetes makes up about 90% of cases um, but it's a, this is a bit of an oversimplification. So when we say type 1 and type 2 diabetes we actually mean typical type 1 and typical type 2 diabetes. So usually patients who are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes tend to be young so they tend to be teenagers um, and they're slimmer. Patients who are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes tend to be older and they tend to be a bit more overweight or obese. Not necessarily but it definitely correlates with it. There are lots of other situations as well where this can happen and as I mentioned earlier pregnancy uh, is a situation where there is a normal physiological increase in insulin resistance. However, in some, uh, in some women who are pregnant, this overflows into actual diabetes. And that's what gestational diabetes is, a temporary condition due to the hormones of pregnancy in which the body can't manage uh, blood sugar adequately. This, um, this usually resolves after, um, after the baby's been delivered and goes completely back to normal, even if the, patient, even if the women have had to have some sort of medication. But we know that over half of them will probably go on to develop type 2 diabetes in the future. So the risk factors for these two things overlap. There's also these other entities when we look at the type 1 diabetes spectrum. And um, this one is called LADA, so late onset autoimmune diabetes in adults. It shares a lot of the features of um, type 1 diabetes, but tends to be diagnosed later on. We have very good examples of this. Our current Prime Minister probably has this sort of diabetes. So it does exist. It's quite, it is there. We know that there are two peaks in diagnosing type 2 diabetes in terms of ages. They probably are a little bit different to each other though. There's also the groups that break the mold and, and don't, uh, don't play by the rules. So we have patients who have type 1 diabetes who also have a insulin resistant um, phenotype. This is incredibly difficult to manage as you, can as you can expect because there are so many processes going against uh, using insulin efficiency that these patients do often uh, find it very difficult to get the balance right. Equally there are um, people who are lean and who exercise and who are athletes but in fact have type 2 diabetes. Their body for some reason has increased insulin resistance and despite what they what they are doing which is following all everything that we suggest to them they still need some help. It gets a little bit um, well it gets interesting in the smaller groups as well so these very um, these much rarer conditions are very interesting to look at and very interesting to investigate from a research point of view because they tell us, they give us hints about these much more common conditions. One group is called MODI, so mature onset diabetes in the young. It shares a lot of features with type 2 diabetes, but can be diagnosed at young ages. It doesn't, it, we usually don't need to use insulin in these, in these patients, uh, but sometimes they are misdiagnosed as type 1 because of the fact that they present so early. Um, there's also this concept of surgical diabetes, which is fairly easy to think about if for whatever reason you would have to remove your pancreas or that it was destroyed by a tumor or pancreatitis or something like that. In amongst all the destruction, the uh, islets are also destroyed. So in this case, uh, these, these patients have diabetes and it's actually more similar to type 1. 
There's some odd ones as well, um, such as <laughs> neonatal diabetes, which is um, uh, it's a condition in which diabetes is diagnosed within the first six months of life. Very rare. Lots of research on this has come from Oxford as well. And it's been one of the very, um, well, it's been one of the, the positive stories that have come out of uh, medical research that actually these children that were initially put onto insulin because that was the, the thought process at the time, once the, di once the um, diagnosis happened, they were able to move to tablets and had much better control. So again, giving us some indications of how diabetes works from these very rare conditions. And finally, there's some other ones as well. There are lots of different causes, but sometimes diabetes is associated with other conditions as well, such as cystic fibrosis. All of these things put together uh, show that there's high variability in the causes, whereas the treatments tend to be a little bit, they tend to be a little bit more prescriptive. So we are not able necessarily to be precise about our treatments unless we have the right diagnosis. And the hope is that genetics will give a much, uh, a different perspective on all of this and, and hopefully tell us where the similarities exist and where the differences exist. And are there, are there some hints that will tell us who to target with what? Um, and so we, we look forward and we look to see what will come out of all of this. But when we talk about managing, um, particularly type 2 diabetes, it's fairly simple from the beginning, and it's things that everybody has heard about from the media as well. It's exercising, healthy eating, and managing weight. We don't actually mean that there is a diet that works for everyone or that there's an exercise regimen that works for everyone. In fact, what we know is that small incremental changes make the biggest difference. So even just being a little bit more careful about what we eat, and if we're in the obese category, even losing five or 10% of our body weight can have huge um, medical benefits. Um, in terms of exercise, it can be as simple as trying to take the stairs or parking a little bit further away. Things like this that probably make a difference um, to the people who would go on to develop type 2 diabetes. But it's not just type 2 diabetes. This is good practice for all of the various types of diabetes. And in pregnancy, um, we, we recommend very similar things. In type 1 diabetes, again, we know that if they are a bit overweight, they can definitely help by um, increasing their, uh, their level of exercise, etc. Now, just as we're getting to the, to the final bit, and we'll, uh, we'll leave some, uh, some space for discussions as well, I just want to share with you some of my thoughts about what would be interesting and what would be um, exciting that's coming in the future. And I just want to say, I, I have no disclosures, so I have no conflicts of interest. These are just things that I think are very interesting. First thing is technology. And it's all around us. We, uh, it's, we monitor pretty much everything nowadays, or at least we have the ability to. Smartphones have apps that allow us to check our pulse rates and make comments about how happy we are at the time. We, these devices measure how we sleep, how we walk, how fast we walk, all of these things. And it's not, it's a lot of information, but we can probably make good use of them as well. What we can most likely do is figure out ways that these can work for us rather than us just trying to play catch up and being excited every single time something new comes out. It's interesting how this will develop as well because uh, there are a lot of pairings with companies that have continuous glucose monitors. Um, so we will likely see in the near future that these sort of devices also monitor blood sugar in some kind of fairly non-invasive way. And from my perspective, that can only be a good thing. We're going to, we're going to have much, uh, much more breadth of information and depth of information. And if we can make good use of it, that's, that is good science. Um, but it's not always straightforward. So some of you may have seen this news article um, 
This is where um, Google, with Google Maps, uh, introduced a new feature where, in addition to, in, in, as a way of trying to encourage people to walk, it would tell them how many calories they would burn if they, if they walked a certain amount of time for a certain distance, but it also translated it into cupcakes. So it would tell them how many cupcakes their walk from the gym uh, equated to. Some people found, found the temptation too great and would stop off at coffee shops and eat those cupcakes. <laughs> so unintended consequences of something that probably had very good intentions. Um, but it's not, it's not all doom and gloom. We have some good examples of where this, this kind of integrated technology can help. Um, in fact, there's a, um, there's a trial going on at the moment uh, uh, working with our colleagues in the obstetrics department and looking at uh, gestational diabetes and ways in which we can use technology to improve care for these patients. Um, this particular trial is looking at a smartphone app that will connect these uh, pregnant ladies with the clinical team and will give them remote uh, They'll be able to upload their information and they will get feedback about how their blood sugar is doing, any changes that they have to make, and some advice about diet and exercise. And the idea behind this is that it will allow this closer collaboration without so many hospital visits. So we look forward to see how this will work. Um, changing gear slightly, um, and now talking more about type 2 diabetes, it we would be amiss if we didn't talk about the contributions that surgery has had in this field as well. It's been revolutionary, especially when uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity go together. The uh, bariatric surgery has been transformative. It's interesting that the effects, the beneficial effects it has on diabetes management happen before weight loss. So there is something extra going on that we haven't figured out just yet. Um, there are newer strategies though of how this is going to expand and some of them are becoming less and less invasive. So this is just an example of what looks a little bit like a snake is, um, it, it is just a film that goes over uh, part of the intestine and diverts part of the food, but without the need for an operation. Um, it's very exciting to see how that is going to develop and how, how this will maybe change the way that we approach obesity and type 2 diabetes. And the final bits, uh, I wanted to focus more on type 1 diabetes. Um, some of you may have come across this concept of uh, or heard about artificial pancreas. Uh, it, it's a little bit of a grandiose term for something that isn't really that. It is a device, it's a, it's a technological device that allows uh, the combination of two other pieces of tech. So insulin pumps are this device over here. They contain a certain amount of insulin and they allow um, it to be programmable as to how much insulin is actually delivered subcutaneously, so just underneath the skin, at any given moment in time. We, we tend to use this in patients with type 1 diabetes who have very difficult to control blood sugars, specifically uh, hypoglycemia episodes. Now, this device can pair up with a type of continuous glucose monitor. So the pump that is delivering the insulin can get information about what impact that insulin is having on the blood sugar. This, these newer devices go one step further they also suspend insulin when it looks like blood sugar is going too low. So they predict hypoglycemia episodes might occur in the next hour or so, and they try to prevent them. What's been approved now by the FDA in the States is even one step further than that. It allows the device to switch off and then either make a suggestion for an improvement to the program or make it itself. So they, they're starting to become more closed loop, i.e. They, they respond to the feedback they get themselves and then generate a new, uh, a new protocol. So that part is very exciting. 
I have my reservations about how exactly this is going to be implemented because the limitation is still how good the sensors are and there are issues with them. So, um, cautiously optimistic. There's also some very exciting stuff about using, trying to be a little bit more physiological, so more natural about how we approach this. And this is using both insulin and its sister hormone, glucagon, to try to manage uh, blood sugar uh, control. Now, glucagon allow, uh, is one of the hormones that causes blood sugar to rise, and it's released by some other cells within the islet that are in very close connection and speak to the um, beta cells that release the insulin. Under normal circumstances, this, uh, this up and down dance between insulin and glucagon goes on continuously. But in people who don't have beta cells because they've been destroyed in type 1 diabetes, that, um, that uh, connection doesn't happen. By, do, by using both glucagon and insulin, it might be the case that they can get much better resolution of hypoglycemia episodes. Um, they're doing a lot of this work in Cambridge, um, as well as in the States, and it's very interesting to see whether some of the technological um, challenges can be overcome so that this can be a, a real implemented solution. Um, and the last bit is something that I, I particularly am interested in. It's something that we do here in Oxford as well, and it's islet transplantation. Um, this is a, a type of transplantation therapy that we occasionally use in uh, patients with type 1 diabetes who have severe life-threatening hypoglycemia episodes. The, the way that this goes about is that you can have your entire pan uh, a pancreas from a deceased donor transplanted, but actually if you all you need are the 2% that are islets to really make a difference to your, um, to your blood sugar control, maybe just putting those in is enough. Um, this has developed over, uh, over a number of years and there was a particularly um, exciting development in the year 2000 that allowed this, um, this kind of transplantation therapy to really, t um, to really take off. We do, in Oxford, about four or five a year, sometimes more, and the idea is that we um, isolate the islets from the pancreas of a deceased donor and then transplant them, so infuse them, into the liver, in this case. Um, they sit there and they're able, to, uh, they're able to produce insulin, they also produce glucagon and all the other hormones. And we think while the, while the results aren't as good as having an entire pancreas, it is a very different procedure. The problem is that these people have to be on lifelong immunosuppression and it's not without its problems. So lots of the work that's going into improving this is focusing on ways to prevent the immune system from attacking this foreign tissue. And this is the bio-artificial pancreas. Effectively, they're envelopes. They're semi-permeable envelopes that allow glucose and oxygen and all the nutrients to come into it while blocking the immune system from destroying the cells. Um, Equally, they allow insulin and glucagon and all the, rest of the, um, all the rest of the hormones that are secreted to come out of the envelope while maintaining their own, uh, while sustaining their own cells. If there are lots of companies that are trying to do this and there's been variable success, but the exciting thing about this is that you wouldn't need immunosuppression and it would mean that this would be a realistic therapy for children whom we can't give islet transplantation to currently because we, there is no justification at present for the use of immunosuppression. It's not like a heart and lung transplant where they will die if they don't have this. We have insulin, we can manage it, but actually it would be incredibly useful if we could deal with diabetes at its origin. So that's where um, we think the next 25 years of diabetes will really take us to not try to play catch up and prevent all the complications of diabetes once they've already happened, but target the initial stages even before the disease has happened, the condition has occurred, and try to manage that. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. 
and I'm very happy to take any questions. <laughs>